Well, hello there, and welcome to day seven of the 12 Days of Craftlet. If you are not a regular Craftlet listener, which has been, it's mostly a weekly podcast since 2006. Hi, my name is Heather, and I'm the host. Welcome. Today, I have a first for you. Well, two firsts, actually. One, the story that you'll listen to today was written by longtime Craftlet listener Bob Greenberger. And two, this is a Hanukkah story. I'm sorry I didn't get a ton in time for the last night of Hanukkah this year, 2023, but knowing how the Jewish calendar works, some year or another, this episode will in fact have timed out perfectly and you would be able to watch it on the last night of Hanukkah. Jewish calendars are either early or late. They are never on time. And a quick word before we listen, Christmas is a big deal for Christians. Even if you were a Martian who knew nothing except how to speak and understand English and you knew nothing about our holidays, a Martian would be able to understand that Christmas and Christian and Christ have a lot to do with each other. There are lots of places where you can go to find out how pagan festivals of lights were co-opted by the church early on. I am not going to go into that other than to say, Good PR and marketing, guys. We should remember this. Learn about other people and what matters to them, you know, before you basically take them over. I know the majority of Craftlet listeners are not Jewish, so I did want to fill you in on a Jewish secret. Hanukkah is not that big a deal. Not in Judaism. For non-Orthodox Jews... It's nice to light the candles and sing the songs. And when your kids are little, you give them a little gift every day, kind of ramping up to a bigger one. But historically, it's a holiday we really couldn't celebrate openly because it's celebrating a successful military uprising against Greek occupiers. Ghettoized Jews would have been very hesitant to make a big deal out of something like that, lest they ruffle the knives of those in power over them. There is a Hanukkah miracle, though. Judah Maccabee and company were able to get back into the temple after kicking out the Greeks, and they found that the departing Greek soldiers had tainted the oil used for the eternal fame by adding pig's blood. So it wasn't that there was only enough oil left for one night. There wasn't enough pure, unsullied oil to keep the eternal flame going for more than 24 hours. Hard to keep the eternal flame going when you don't have any oil. So it was a little miracle, a bisla. It's not a star in the sky. It's not the appearance of angels heralding anything on high, but it is a reminder that even in the face of insurmountable odds, when you're fighting an opposing force that is richer than you, more politically powerful than you, and that outnumbers you, it doesn't mean the fight is over if you stick together, like the Maccabees. I once heard an explanation for Jesus' miracle of the loaves and fish that the miracle was actually the community because as the baskets of bread and fish and the bottles of wine were being passed through the enormous crowd of listeners, those who had more shared by adding to the baskets and those who had none took from the baskets. And that's how real life miracles happen. Chances are the miracle was the same in the original Hanukkah. Not enough pure oil to keep the light going? In my mind's eye, I see individuals quietly sneaking into the temple to leave a small jar of pure oil over and over and over again to keep the community light lit so everyone could see. The Hanukkah story I'm bringing you today presents us with a different kind of Jewish tale, one of ethics and humor. You got to have a joke in there somewhere. Am I right? On the flip side of this episode, I'm going to share a conversation that I had with Bob about his work and his story, which is also a rare gift, an interview. But for now, please enjoy Craftlet's exclusive production of Bob Greenberger's brand new story, A Spin for the Ages, read for you 
by Aidan Ordover. As the dreidel spun, catching the low lighting, its 24 karat gold gleamed and its Swarovski crystals glittered. Compared to the usual plastic fare Gabe Hurstjorn was accustomed to, this was a substantial dreidel to reckon with. It had been given to him just that night, the first of Hanukkah, which also happened to be Shabbat. His parents made it the first night gift, complete with its antique synagogue stand, setting a high bar for what was to be his bar mitzvah. On a chilly Friday night, Gabe sat idly spinning the dreidel, humming the one song everyone knew about the toy in the all-purpose room adjacent to the sanctuary, having already nibbled on the ceremonial challah bread and drunk the awful grape juice. He didn't know the other kids, since that weekend's bar mitzvah boy was from the other side of town and went to a different high school. They were on the other side of the room, in small clusters, cracking jokes, making fun of the other bar mitzvah boy. All the adults were in their own small worlds, munching on honey cake and challah bread, sharing gossip or complaining about sports, politics, schools, the usual. Being next to the synagogue, the noise level was respectfully kept low, with the occasional outburst of laughter, or, you're kidding. With his own ceremony, a mere two months off, Gabe had been required to start attending Friday night services to see how it went, what prayers were said, and what was discussed. As a result, he felt particularly tired given how early his high school swimming practices were held, making the long days even longer. Normally, his parents only brought him during the major holidays. He'd already been on the bar mitzvah circuit for months now, and had slowly started paying attention to the speeches each newly minted adult, at least in the eyes of the Jewish community, said. Most weren't funny, but delivered in halting or graceful tones, connecting the Torah reading with something in their lives. Few got political, and the one who delivered a flamethrower of a speech was nearly run out of the synagogue by an angry congregation. His parents that night instilled in him the notion of not being controversial. He had listened to the Torah reading, 25 Kislev 5784, and tried to imagine how he would turn that into a speech. It was about Moses fulfilling the Lord's command that tributes be provided to the new tabernacle by each of the twelve families. An interesting reading at a time when parents, leaders of their families, gave the children, not the Lord, gifts. In both cases, it was an act of love, so maybe that might be an interesting common denominator to work with. So lost in thought was he, Gabe didn't notice the older man wander by him, holding his own cup of Manischewitz vine. The man watched the dreidel spin, dancing in the light, casting reflections on the nearby faded brown wallpaper. Gabe hadn't noticed that the conversation was fading from his ears. That's quite the dreidel, no? he said in a friendly voice. Gabe looked up and took in the man, who was at least sixty, with a high forehead and graying hair that ringed the back of his skull. He wore a dark gray suit, a red and yellow striped tie, and a white shirt. His yarmulke was a black nylon one, from the basket near the temple's entrance, so Gabe concluded that he must be a visitor, maybe related to the bar mitzvah boy. He preferred his Transformers yarmulke, which his mother frowned at, but it made the canter laugh. It's nice, the man said about the dreidel. And it was, even if he wasn't sure what to do with such a fancy toy after the eight-day holiday ended. I'm Birsha, he said, holding out his hand with its liver spots and paleness. He wasn't sure if the name was the man's first or last, but didn't ask. Having been taught to make eye contact and return the offering with a firm grip, Gabe introduced himself in turn. You know, I've never played... He told the twelve-year-old. In all my travels, it just never seemed to come up. Really? I thought every family played. It's pretty easy. Tell me, Birsha said. Well, first we need something to win. It can be candy or, if I'm lucky, some coins. The man lowered his paper plate, loaded it with challah and assorted rugelach. So, let's practice with these. Good? Sure, he replied. Now we each take a turn spinning the dreidel, and depending on which letter comes up, we win or lose. Explain to me, if you would be so kind, these meanings. Holding up the handcrafted and expensive new dreidel, Gabe showed each side and explained, Nun stands for nothing in the game, and the player does nothing. Gimel means everything, and the player wins the entire pot. Hey is half, and you win half the pot, and Shin means put in, so the player must add more to the pot. I see. A game of chance. So we are teaching youngsters to gamble at an early age, the man said. Gabe shrugged and laughed. I guess. 
it's also more than that. It also reminds us that a great miracle occurred there, there being the first Hanukkah. He spun the dreidel, and the nun was face up. Nothing for you, yes? Yep. Your turn, Gabe said, handing the man the dreidel. Birsha hefted the metal and jewel spinning top, examining it. He then gripped the top piece and gave it a twirl on the laminate flooring. It showed hay. A good half, yes? Sure, Gabe said. The man left the plate untouched and asked to go again. So they spun for the next few minutes, with Gabe having to run to the snack table from a rugelach when he spun a shin. Birsha never touched the growing pile of food, even though Gabe enjoyed the apricot pastry the best. You play well, Birsha told him, as Gabe ate another apricot morsel. Shall we go for something of greater value? I didn't bring anything else. Birsha removed a fat money clip from his jacket pocket and peeled off a $100 bill. He placed it beside the paper plate. You may win this money, or if you lose, you must steal the yard from the bima. Gabe gaped at that, asking him to take the pointer which hung from the rolled holy Torah scrolls. He practiced with the lung reader, which tapered until it ended with a hand, the index finger extended to guide the reading. You're crazy, Gabe said, still staring at the bill. He had never touched such a denomination, let alone owned one. He was certainly tempted. Birsha cocked an eyebrow, and somehow the light shadowed his eyes, and a chill ran through the adolescent. Okay, sure, Gabe said, figuring the man didn't really mean it, and handed the dreidel to him. Your turn. The man spun, and the nun was face up. Okay, he could live without getting the cash, but he was very relieved not to have to steal. Birsha studied the dreidel with a frown. Without a word, he added a second hundred-dollar bill to the pile, and then handed the toy to its owner. Rubbing the dreidel between his palms, Gabe hoped to win the pot. He then spun the toy, and the hate was facing him. With a big grin, he snatched one of the two bills and stuffed it into his suit jacket's inside pocket. Would you like to play for better stakes? Birsha asked after several more turns. Maybe for something far more substantial. It had grown very quiet, Gabe noticed. But his parents hadn't come to collect him for home, so he decided he had more time to play. I don't have any money on me, Gabe said. I really don't want to steal anything. He began to wonder what the man might have in mind. He began to notice that no one paid attention to them in their game, which was unusually. Normally this would attract others, especially if coins were involved. Idly, he wondered if this man was someone to be wary of, someone his parents and teachers warned him about. But Birsha didn't offer him drugs, didn't try to touch him, or do nothing more than to ask some innocent questions about his schooling and the game. His stranger danger alarm was not going off. That's fine, Birsha said. How would you like me to play for you? Me? I don't understand. You have a neshama, which is the breath that God breathed into you, yes? I guess. Is that like the soul? It is the soul. Birsha looked at him, and there was a flicker in the light around him. The luster of the dreidel, lying on its side, dimmed. You want to play for my soul? What are you, the devil? He actually smirked at the older man, not believing the melodramatic flair. I'll play for money or more food. Young man, what if I confirmed for you that I am indeed the devil? Satan, Lucifer Morningstar, Old Scratch. You have all given me so many names. Okay, this guy was nuts. Maybe it was time to rejoin his parents. But Gabe realized he couldn't make out the people behind Birsha. The world had gotten dimmer, everything fuzzier. What exactly was happening to him? And more importantly, why him? We don't believe in the devil, Gabe said defiantly. You don't believe in me as a physical manifestation. No, that is correct. But you do believe in Yetzar Hara, the idea of evil and temptation. After all, the snake in the Garden of Eden came from somewhere, yes? Your Rabbi Grossman teaches that this is an internal struggle within each individual between inclinations toward good and evil. The more mystical of you, those who practice the Kabbalah, have the concept of Sidra Akra, impurity and evil. And that's you? Yes. That is me, Gabriel Allen Hirshhorn. I am asking you to play with you and your dreidel for your soul. One spin. This was beyond anything he imagined was possible. But Gabe also felt stuck. He tried to stand but couldn't. They were within something that kept them unseen by others. 
That alone should convince him he was dealing with something unnatural, but this man knew his full name and wanted something. This was some test. What kind and by whom was unclear, but he was an athlete and winning was part of who he was. What do I get if I win? What are you putting in the pot? An excellent question. Is there something you desire? Money? To take Mindy Sholnick to bed? To sign the largest baseball contract in history? What do you desire? Cape was shocked to hear Mindy's name. No one, and he meant no one, knew he had the hots for Mindy. But he also read enough and watched enough to know about deals with the devil. Uh-huh. You are tempting me, and that will throw me off my game. You need to offer up something I am not craving. Beersha nodded, and a sly smile crossed his features. Did you have something in mind? Did he? He got up and walked in a small circle, thinking of what could be equal to his soul. He considered his many talks with Cantor Gaber as he prepared for his bar mitzvah, the discussions on morals and ethics with Mr. Bailey in social studies, the lessons his parents had instilled in him since birth. He was a child of privilege in that he had family, a house, access to education, friends, and family. He knew so many did not have any of those. He'd heard his parents discuss the news and the struggles of other countries. He thought hard for at least a minute and then turned to face his opponent. What about you must promise to end all global malevolence and embrace goodness for eternity? Beersha laughed out loud at the presumptuous offer. Gabe glanced around to see if anyone heard the outburst, but they were alone. Your little soul for something so grand? You think so much of your spinning prowess. I think highly of my soul. As you should, Beersha said. It's a lovely one, bright and pure and good. It's the shiniest one in the room, and therefore the one I want. Also, I have faith on my side, Gabe said, understanding this was his shibboleth test of character and faith, much as God had tested Abraham. This emboldened him, finding some inner strength he hadn't recognized. This was unlike any swim meet he'd competed in, but there he knew his mental attitude was as important as his stroke. After all, you want to play with the dreidel, which represents the miracles and resilience of my ancestors during the first Hanukkah. You seem to have found some courage, or false bravado. Which shall it be, young man? Do you truly believe your faith can beat me, you, a twelve-year-old boy? Maybe he was hiding the sheer terror at the idea that he might be dealing with the actual devil, but he didn't want to show it. Instead, he said, you picked me. You must want me pretty badly so put up. I admit to being impressed by such words. You truly believe your soul is worth changing. I am known by several names, and have responsibilities and duties to the heavenly host. You're a tempter. You're evil. My parents say the world is filled with too much evil. If you change your ways, maybe it'll help. Beersha stroked his chin and thought, the light reflecting in his dark eyes. Ignoring the words and their implications, Gabe began spinning his dreidel, noting the toy didn't reflect much light. He needed to play so he could be rid of this threat. Deal, Beersha said. Do we sign something? Gabriel asked, recalling the legends. My black book? This is not some Arthur Miller play, Beersha said indignantly. Who? Never mind. Your word is your bond. You will spin first. Gabe needed a moment. If all of this was truly happening, he needed to be strong, and he needed his faith more than ever. So he held up his hand. Closing his eyes, he took a deep breath, and then in Hebrew he said, Baruch Ata Adonai, we praise Elohim, you, Melech eternal God, God, sovereign of the universe, Meloik, who makes us holy God. on this, the first Therefore, night of Hanukkah. I remember the courage of the Maccabees, who fought for their faith. Their victories are called on the dreidel. Each letter, Nes Gadol Hayasham, recalls to us the great miracle that happened there, representing divine intervention. May you guide me in this holy test of faith. He clutched the dreidel and stared at the man before him. Birsha, for his part, sat on the ground, bushy eyes in shadow. He seemed perfectly content to let his opponent pray. Clearly, he felt confident, certain that somehow the dreidel would spin in his favor. Gabe turned the toy over in his hand, recalling his lessons trying to divine a deeper meaning for each letter. One by one, he considered the letter, its literal meaning, its meaning to the game, and then tried to dig deeper. 
as his rabbi has taught him when he was first introduced to Torah study as a part of his bar mitzvah preparation. He told himself he would interpret each letter to have an extra layer of meaning. Nun would stand for nonchalantly confident in his ability to overcome the devil. Gimel became give me more chances, allowing him to continue the game even if he has lost a round. Hey transformed into hey look over there, hoping to distract the devil at crucial moments. Finally, Shin would become Shin bright like a dreidel, filling the room with a radiant light to dispel the devil's darkness. These would be his guiding principles as he began the game of his life. Ready, Beersha prompted him. Yes, he replied, and spun the dreidel. As it spun, something glowed to his right, and both turned to look and see, appearing out of nowhere, a shimmering menorah. It was a Hanukkiah, a menorah with nine branches, one for the Shamash, eight for each night of Hanukkah. Well, that's unexpected, Birsha said sourly. The dreidel continued to spin, and Gabe began to wonder what was going on. Where'd the menorah come from? His mind supplied a possible answer. His prayers were actually heard. Something divine, a representative of Adonai perhaps, heard his pure thoughts and saw the stakes. The hand of Adonai provided him with the menorah, and it glowed with burning light, much as it did for Judah and his Maccabees. And still the dreidel spun. Birsha was clearly made uncomfortable by the bright flickering light. He focused instead on the dreidel as its spin finally degraded and flopped over. Gimel. Give me everything, he told Birsha. The man rose, an imposing figure, but there were no shadows cast. The light seemed to surround them both, bright and sure. This is null and void. I refuse to acknowledge the result. There has been something fraudulent here. Gabriel picked up the dreidel and held it in his palm. Its metal was cool, the crystals glittered, nothing about it felt different. Try it, he offered. Birsha glared at it and sneered. Something manipulated the spin. At that, the menorah flared brighter. Bah! And brighter still, Birsha recoiling from it, adjusting his rumpled suit. Gabe stood up as well, carefully imitating the figure. Suits were kind of new to him, and he knew they needed to be treated well, so they lasted. He still could not see beyond their little sphere. The figures beyond it remained indistinct. With each passing moment, he began to wonder if the devil would renege on the deal. What loophole was he going to find? They each had something on the line, and they agreed to the spin. The menorah didn't appear until after the spin, so it had little bearing on the events. Still, he couldn't shake it, feeling nervous as the adrenaline that fueled him began to wear off. His mind kept shouting at him, You're playing with the devil, of course there's going to be a trick. Best two out of three he offered, attempting to show some compassion. It may give you a shot at redemption. He remembered Rabbi Grossman's lesson about redemption. She called it Geula, the rightful getting back of something that once belonged to a family but had been lost. If he truly was the devil, then he was someone who belonged to Adonai. This was a chance for Birsha to redeem himself. You, young man, are filled with grace and compassion, things I lost long ago. So thank you very much for the kind offer, but no, our deal was a spin and you won. Your faith appears to be rather strong, given the celestial sign you were given. So, you win, I lose. Now I need to figure out how exactly I am going to honor my end of the bargain. How am I going to know if you keep your end of the bargain? Birsha glared at him. But then his face changed, his expression softened, and a small smile appeared. Not everything is instantaneous. Your generation and its need for instant gratification. It'll be the end of civilization as we know it. That's what pop Up tells me, Gabe interrupted. Smart man. It'll be the downfall of mankind, and I had nothing to do with it. No, Gabriel, it will take time. It will show itself in ways small and grand. For me to do better, you need to do the work, too. You will be tested again and again and each time you must resist the Yetzer Hurrah. Resist me, and we'll both do better, yes? Gabe nodded, struck at the enormity of what he was hearing. He'd have to do a lot of thinking and praying to do. You're observant. It's a good trait. You will see my hand in defense. When? 
Beersha actually laughed at the youth, which annoyed Gabe, whose euphoria at beating the devil was fading. How about tonight? The Lord has plans for you, and maybe, just maybe, he sent me to test you, to see if you are ready. A test like the way he tested Job? I tested Job. Yes, it was at his behest, because I was told that there is nothing like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. I was to test that belief. Gabe's eyes went wide. You're comparing me to Job? Are you a blameless and upright man? He asked. Gabe shook his head. Not yet. I am not a man until February. Reciting the Torah is just part of your particular rite of passage, then, Beersha said. The menorah grew in intensity, so much so that Gabe was forced to shut his eyes and sit again. He could sense the light finally fading, and when he dared to crack a lid, there was no menorah, no birsha, no sense of a barrier between him and everyone else. In fact, the post-service gathering appeared to be still going on, ignoring him. All he saw was his still glittering dreidel and the paper plate of food. His hand rushed to the jacket pocket, and the crisp $100 bill was there. Something did happen. This was no hallucination. Gabers, his mother called, coming over to him. Get off the floor, please. You're going to get the suit dirty, and I need it for tomorrow's services. What have you been doing? Just playing with my new dreidel, he told her, rising. I think I'm getting pretty good at it. So after recording this, Aiden brought up the Chekhov's gun, or what he called Chekhov's dreidel. But Bob's description in the beginning of the dreidel is so specific and so crafted that Aiden kind of expected it to be the linchpin at the climax of the story. And I said I thought it kind of was, that the dreidel is what attracted Satan. Any kid who gets a dreidel like that for the first night of Hanukkah? Well, maybe Satan thought Gabe would be an easy mark. Just a greedy, spoiled kid. But Gabe's decision to ask for Satan to end all global malevolence and embrace good for eternity, that surprised me as much as it surprised Bersha, whose name might have rung a bell for some of you. He was the horrible king of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, who Abraham stopped. There's a phrase in Judaism, tikkun olam, healing the world. There's a lot to unpack in that phrase. And and like with everything in Judaism, if you put five Jews in a room, you will get 10 opinions. So this is not the definitive definition of tikkun olam, but I think it fits nicely here because the idea that Gabe is going to be doing some of this work, Satan's going to stop malevolent evil, but the good in the world has to come from the people in the world, and that's us. In the first century of the Common Era, after the destruction of the Seneca Temple, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Tarfan who said rather famously, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. The world needs us to be as good as we can possibly be and make decisions as ethically as we possibly can. And as you probably have noticed, all of this week for the first six days of the 12 days of Craplet, there have been ethical themes running through all of the stories, and that's going to continue until day 10, and then we'll kind of take a break. I also thought it was interesting that one of the things Satan said to Gabe was, you'll be tested again and again, and I think that's important. I have gotten into the habit of saying when I'm talking to somebody in customer service and they say, is there anything else I can do for you? I have now started saying, yes, do you have a button for world peace and happiness? And it's been fascinating because some people are so befuddled at having something that is clearly not part of their script uh, pop up in a conversation that they don't know how to respond. And others have said, I am doing what I can, man. And then we laugh and it's a little bit of a better day and we move on. But it's kind of not a joke, right? The only way this gets better is if all of us do better. And we will be tested again and again and again. And in order to deal with those tests, 
sometimes I think we just need to slow down and take a breath like Gabe. Maybe pray for a moment. Stop. Let all the crazy wash away. And think, if there was no evil in the world, how would this work out? And what would you do? Hello. Well, hello there. Hey, look at you. How, you how are you? Uh, I actually, you caught me on a good day. Yesterday was not a good day. Well, you picked the day, so lucky us. So, you you have in my in my uh, lexicon of life, you have always been a writer. Yes. You wrote, okay, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong. You wrote Star Trek novels, yes, among other things, which is how you worked with John Ordover. Yep. My husband's cousin. Yep. Keeping it all in the family. That's right. So we have this kind of circle of life going on yeah. between Bob and Heather, this kind of remote thing. What other things did you write other than, than Star Trek novels? I... I started doing a lot of uh, media tie-in fiction. So it was novels based on various properties, Zorro, the Green Hornet, Fun. Star Trek, Hellboy, you know, just a wide range of uh, properties. I've also done nonfiction on media properties, Star Trek, After Earth. Um, so it's been a real weird mix. And then I started doing more original work, um, through the Crazy Aid Press digital hub that I am a co-founder of for the last decade. And so they've been doing a lot of short stories and science fiction, fantasy, some real world stuff. So it is in part of my life I want to continue to do. Right. How are you doing that while you're teaching? I've always found time going all the way back to um, my day job at DC Comics in the 80s, um, nights and weekends. And then with when there were kids, it became weekends. Right. Uh, yeah. And now it's a challenge uh, sometimes to find the time. Um, I am a full-time high school teacher for English at a private school in Maryland. And I have also been doing adjunct work at the Maryland Institute College of Art which means my deal with my wife was if I do this extra teaching, I have to cut way back on the writing. So I've got a bunch of short work lined up, a very long list uh, for my Christmas break. Excellent. So do you have a writing, um, like a writing routine, like a writing process? Is it up at a certain time, longhand typing? You know, what are, what do you, what's your deal, man? When I went to college at the uh, State University of New York at Binghamton, I trained to be a journalist. And there, uh, the idea of a blank screen or a blank page didn't exist because right. you had to write yes. on deadline. They needed 15 column inches of the story, boom. So I've always had the ability to hit my desk and just get started. Um, I'm not... My career has been a, a fairly average writer's career. I've had no bestsellers. I've had no, you know, award-winning things. Of, of, you know, I'm never going to be up for a Pulitzer or a book or anything. But I am a reliable journalist. I'm a reliable fiction and nonfiction writer. And I get work because people can count on me. And yeah. I'm writing about things I have an expertise in. Uh, the writing routine is I sit at my desk and I write. That's I research, awesome. I write, I polish, I submit. You, you type. You're not longhand. No, I'm not longhand. I, that was pretty much beaten out of me by the time we got the first Macintosh in 1984. <gasps> we were the first kids Yay. on the block with it. Oh. So I wanted to date you basically when I was in college because... The guy who had the Mac is, in fact, the guy who I wound up dating. Oh, fun. Other guys, other guys had, you know, K-Pros, but Russ, Russ had, he had the Mac. And boy, fonts were fun. Yes, they were. 
especially the disc swapping sound when you switch fonts. That was okay. So, so to me, the kind of writer that you sound like in Toto is very much like my Oxford theater professors who had been all of the villains on the Avengers several times. Okay. You know, the reliable, like, I need an excellent character actor who can show up, hit his marks, do the job. It's awesome. And then they go back and they get to have a normal life while Diana Rigg is never able to not be in a black leather cat suit for the rest of her life, which is not a bad thing. That's a pretty good analogy. And it's not one I've heard before. Leave it to me. The other thing that struck me, though, is if your training was in was in journalism, the other person who comes to mind is Terry Pratchett, having oh. said that that's why he was not just as reliable as he was as, as a as an author, but able to just like get the thing done because and he said the same thing, like there is no such thing as a blank screen. There is no such thing as the the fear of the the empty page because it's like time's a waste, man. Oh yeah, it's great training. Exactly, it was it's great training. And when um, I started at a magazine house before DC Comics, it continued the training and get me um, get me reliable and get me fast and good. And then when I moved into comic books and then prose that really opened up this whole other world. And so it was a, a, a good six, eight years before I tried any type of fiction. Wow. And then I, it was a media tie-in of a Star Trek. So it was like, it's a known property. I didn't have to invent all that much and characters existed. And it was a really good training ground to understand how to use them and uh, reset the pieces at the end of the story. When you say it like that, it sounds like professional fan fiction. People have equated um, media tie-in writers with professional fan fiction, but depending upon the property, sometimes it is considered canon for that license. Right. That's important because you've done canon work. Yes. That's all you've done. That's so but, cool. You know, it, you know, it varies because you might find yourself in a situation where like, uh, when Lucasfilm sold Disney, they took everything Del Rey had published and said, yeah, that, we're not doing that anymore. They, they, Is that why I can't find it? No, they've done new stuff, but the canon they had was thrown out the window and they started fresh. So for the 12 Days of Craft Lit, I've always been doing Christmas stories because that is 999% what I can find that's in the public domain. Sure. And... And that is seasonal. I have never come across a public domain Hanukkah story. I had no idea. Okay. So well, that doesn't mean they aren't out there. That just means they aren't where I've been looking. Interesting. Yeah. Well, what's funny is um, in the last year, I've end, ended up writing two different uh, Judaism-based stories for two different anthologies. Really? Yeah, one was called Jewish Futures, uh, which came out over the summer, which was a collection of all original stories about speculation of where Jews are in, in the future, on Earth, in space, whatever. You know, um, you know, it goes from things like the AI who wants to convert. That's oh, my God, that makes perfect sense. I love that. Oh my God, my entire family is going to love that idea. That's hilarious. My That's story perfect. for that book uh, was a variation on the Siegel and Schuster story of creating Superman to deal with their their not great lives in Cleveland in the 1930s. Um, but this story has been for the ages. Um, Crazy A Press was going to be doing an anthology of weird, wacky, holidays not just christmas but any pick a holiday st swithin's day easter whatever awesome swithin's doesn't get enough play and i'm not sure where this came from i think i my wife and i bang you know 
she's an amazing sounding board. Usually we're out walking the dog and, and we talk about this sort of thing. And I came up with the idea that, all right, Judaism does not have a devil figure. No, it doesn't. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. So what if the devil right. wanted to um, try get his hands on a Jewish soul? And of course, it's a spin of a dreidel during Hanukkah. Perfect. Perfect. And there are layer there are layers and layers, but okay. The first layer is Satan does show up in the quote unquote Old Testament, mm -hmm. but only in the book of Job. And you cite the book of Job in right. your story. So for I was just squealing. I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing good. Okay. Well, I will get. I have to give credit to Michael and Nomi Burstein from Boston. Um, Michael is a longtime friend. They're both Orthodox Jews, and Michael is an accomplished writer. He edited the Jewish Futures Anthology. Um, the two of them were my consultants, making sure I got my Judaism facts correct. Excellent. Well, tell him thank you. I don't know if the majority of Craftlet listeners knew that there was no Satan mm -hmm. in in Judaism. And that the, the concept of evil even is kind of there there's tell me if I've got this right. There's that that whole idea of you you are the master of your domain. Right. <laughs> you you can't expect anybody else to get you out of a problem that you've gotten yourself into and that includes giant ethical dilemmas but your your take on how this would play out did you always know how you were going to end it yes it was it was there for the original pitch i had to give to um hilde silverman who was the editor of the anthology that wasn't uh, we kickstarted it. It was one of the rare misfires. It did not reach its funding goal. So the story is orphaned until everyone hears it today. Yay! I'm glad we could be the the uh, releaser of the awesome. So the when uh, I'll I'll be honest with you when he first shows up, the the mystery man first shows up. Mm -hmm. I'm immediately thinking it's holiday. It's Alamed Vavnik. Right. And you let me stay there for a while. And and the the idea is that you could any anybody who you come across could be one of these thirty six right righteous people. I think. I mean, yeah, I mean, they show up as people in the stories, but then they always do what your guide does, and you know, disappear. And yeah. if if you treat them badly, you get you know bupkis, and if you treat them nicely, things go well for you. Yeah. So our little kid, you gave him a really nice dilemma. I try. It reminded me of the whole, um, you're talking to two people and one of them always lies and one of them never lies. What's the one question you can ask them that will get you the, the answer that you need? Mm. What's the other guy going to tell me? Right. And And this felt very much like that kind of, uh, logic game, which I also thought was very fitting for it being a Hanukkah story and a Jewish story. Well, the other part for me was the fact that he is studying for his bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. which is a point in a, a Jewish person's life where you are more steeped in the, the lore of Judaism than you are at any other time of your life. Yeah. Unless you become a scholar. Right. So he's keenly aware of, you know, the options available to him. Right. So 
Was there anything about this story in particular that when I put out the call and said, this time I would like to have people submit stories if they've got them, that made you go, oh yeah. Was it just that it was on the shelf or was it like, no, there's craft, but people will get something know, here. As you know, Deb and I are, are longtime listeners. Yeah. And I love the fact that I can give back a little bit because I did have the story on the shelf. Even if the book had seen print, uh, I made sure I had permission to submit it when you were going to start looking. Awesome. So, awesome. you know, why, why not share? I think I think we need to do more of this, too. I don't know how many writers we have in the craft lit world. Uh, you've implied that you've got more than a few. But uh, yeah, there. well, there are people who, there's the, the wannabes. And I worry right. that the wannabes, what they're actually doing is they're writing in isolation and they're not, they don't have a community that they feel safe. In a that. creative environment, you can get so locked into your vision, don't recognize where the flaws are necessarily. Yes. So people who tell me they're their best editors, I, I cock an eyebrow and was like, mm, perhaps, mm. maybe grammatically. That, but yeah. Story structure. But not revision. Not revisioning, see, seeing it for what it is and the, the strengths and the flaws yeah. and everything. So do you have any more stories coming that you are uh, releasing with Crazy? Um, it is Crazy at Press. Not at the moment. There's one we just finished kickstarting that I have to write, which is a original superhero shared universe called The Phenomenons. Ooh. We've done two volumes already, so we just are getting to work on volume three. And other than that, actually, my Christmas break, I'm going to be writing a lot about Superman for a forthcoming book from Inside Editions. Oh. So. So that's on deck. That's on deck, and I look forward to it. So do you have audiobook versions of your books? The, the you know, the publishers sneak them in when I'm not looking. I had done an Iron Man book for, for Del Rey Books, and they had done some license for audiobooks. And I see it on sale and I write to the editor going, do I get a copy? They said, no. So I had to buy one. It's ridiculous. How do you not get a copy? I think we need to work on your contract. Well, you know, at the time, I'm, you know, I did that book back in 2008, 2009. Oh, like, yeah, no, it's... And the audio came out like five years ago. So, you know, contracts keep evolving. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, though. Yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Good for so me. this is awesome. Thank you so much oh, for absolutely. talking to me about your story. Appreciate it. You bet. All right. We'll talk right, we'll soon. Talk. Bye. Sounds good. Bye. I hope you are having a fabulous 12 days of Craftlet, and I look forward to bringing you more tomorrow. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.